Good morning. A warm welcome to St. Andrew's Church and a warm welcome to those um, worshipping from home. Today we welcome Alan Dodds who has kindly come along uh, to lead us in worship. So thank you very much indeed Alan for coming to help us out. Very few notices today. Firstly, there will be no rig service th this evening. Christian Aid Next Sunday at 6 p.m., Christian Aid service will be held in the United Reformed Church. The service will be led by the Reverend Nick Mark. Christian Aid, they are still looking for a representative from Ann and St. Andrew's Church to join the committee. If anyone is willing, please contact Sarah Dames, and I have a, a phone number here. Spring Concert. There will be a spring concert with the Rainbow Tribe and Spectrum in the United Reformed Church on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Any donations received will go to support the Arts Holiday Club. Uh, the Holiday Club launch night is on Thursday the 17th of May. Anyone wishing to help out or just to see what uh, happens at the Holiday Club, please go along to Anna and Old Parish Church at 7 p.m on that evening. And finally, the Hearing Aid Clinic will be here in the church hall on Tuesday between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock. Thank you. Over to you, Alan. Thanks, David. <coughs> Good morning. It's lovely to be back with you again. So let's worship the Lord, which is the prime function of the church. Come to God because he gives light and dark lives he gives hope and despair. He gives peace 
in life's storms. He gives love to each and every one of us. We come to worship the God of life. Let us pray. Loving God, we've come in the name of Jesus to worship you and offer our praise and thanks. We've come to seek your will. We've come to hear your word. We've come to ask your forgiveness and your blessing. Help us as we worship to recognize Jesus among us, to catch sight of your glory through him, to hear his voice in scripture, in prayer and in praise, and to feel his love through the fellowship we share and to see more clearly where we can serve him best to meet the needs of the church and of the world. Lord God, may our worship today help us to live to the glory of Jesus' name. Amen. We sing the second praise item on your sheet now, which is, Blessed be your name. I've chosen for this morning, I could have taken it from any one of the Gospels because 
The same story appears in all of them. But I've chosen to read it from Mark's Gospel. It's Mark chapter 6, beginning to read at verse 31. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he was saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and all were satisfied. Thanks be to God for this reading from his word and to his name be praise and glory forever. Now I want to tell you a little story. I'm going to sit down here to do it, so I'll... No, I don't think I'll sit in the small chair. <laughs> I think I'll sit in the bigger one. <laughs> now then, here's a question for, you, the whole, for all of you. How many of you play a musical instrument? Just put your hand up if you can play a musical instrument. One, two. Davy Hopper hasn't got his hand. Oh, yes, he has. I couldn't, couldn't, couldn't see him around the corner. Davy thinks he can play a musical instrument. <laughs> Oh, oh, over here as well. Well, that's not bad. Now, I'm going to be honest and say, I, I strum the guitar a little bit, but not well. But I have in my pocket a musical instrument that absolutely anybody can play. And it's a musical instrument that was invented by the lead trumpeter for George Frederick Handel. He realised that everywhere he went to play, he couldn't, the people couldn't tune up properly. So everybody at that time used to tune to an organ. Well, anybody who knows anything about organs will know that they go out of tune. So he came up with this. I can play this musical instrument. There you are. That's middle C, by the way. Um, anybody can play it. But you see, the point about what I'm trying to say here is that it's important. This is what any orchestra uses when they're tuning up before a concert. The lead violinist tunes his violin to one of these. And then the rest of the orchestra tune up to him. So that's the most important instrument in the orchestra. Can you imagine what it sounds like if they didn't tune up to each other? It would be like the singing is in some churches I go to. <laughs> I'm not saying that about this one. Um, but that's important. The important thing is, though, every one of us need a middle C. Now, middle C is, is a musical term. I'll put that back in my pocket. Every one of us needs a middle C. Here's the second part of this story. The author of the, the famous book called The Robe, when he was at college, lived upstairs above a retired musical teacher. And every morning when he came downstairs, he would open the teacher's door and he would say, how's the world today? And the teacher would put his hand in his pocket, take out his tuning fork, hit it on the side of his wheelchair, and he would say, 
That's middle C. Middle C never changes. That would be middle C 100 years ago. It would be middle C in 100 years' time. That's the world today. We have middle C. We have Jesus. Middle C, Jesus are the same thing as far as we're concerned. We go by Jesus and what he said, what he did, and what his life tells us. And as long as we've got that middle C in our lives, we can't go wrong. Now then, I can't think, can't remember what we're supposed to be doing next. Dean. I'll just check it on this piece of paper. I'll tell you what, we'll just change it slightly and we'll now sing Reckless Love.
Poor Chippy, the parakeet, never knew what hit him. One minute he was sitting in his cage, twittering away, chirping away quite happily. And the next minute, the lady who cared for him decided it was time to clean out his cage. So she went and got the hoover, took all the attachments off it, got the blank end of the hose, went in and started cleaning the bottom of Chippy's cage. Then the phone rang. Never do two things at once. She turned to answer the phone, and the next thing there was a strange pop sound. Poor old Chippy vanished down the hose. Well, she panicked. She opened up the hoover. Unfortunately, it wasn't one of these modern things. It was an old-fashioned one. She opened it up, and there was the poor bird sitting there, covered in dust and fluff. So she did what any sensible bird owner would do. She grabbed the bird, rushed upstairs, and got him in the shower, and got him washed down. She took him back downstairs and then she realised that the poor bird was absolutely soaking wet and he was shivering. So she did again what any caring person would do. She took him back upstairs, got the hairdryer and blasted him dry with a hairdryer. So poor old Chippy, he was sucked in, he was washed up and he was blown over. All in the spell of a few minutes. Question for you. Can you relate to Chippy? Haven't we been just like that? We've had days where we've been sucked in, washed up and blown over all in one day. Of course we can. Life can go from calm to stormy in an instant, as we all know. Nobody's exempt from it. And the good news is, neither was Jesus. He wasn't exempt from it either. He had at least one such day. And it must have been important because all four Gospels include at least part of it in the narrative. So, once upon a time in Galilee, Jesus has a day of highs and lows, just like our days. During this day, he's got reason to cry, run, shout, curse, praise, and doubt. He goes from calm to chaos, from peace to perplexity. His world is turned upside down. But in all the troubles and triumphs, there's one golden thread runs right through this story. Something we can all hang on to. It says this, Jesus knows how you feel. Doesn't matter what happens, Jesus knows how you feel. And if you ever wondered as you ride the roller coaster of life, if God can relate to our life on earth, then read and reread about this day in the life of Jesus. Now I used Mark Mark's Gospel, the whole story is in Mark 5 and 6. I just chose to do the ending of it. But we can take heart from this because it's true. Jesus knows how I feel. Let's look at this day. The morning begins quite normally. And then the news of John the Baptist's death comes. John was perhaps the only person who knew and understood Jesus. He was Jesus' friend. So how would he feel? Horror? at the way John died, sadness and grief that he'd gone. Jesus has no time to mourn because just as he's into this mourning state, the disciples appear and they've been out on one of their first trips around the countryside telling, telling the good news and they come back and they say, look, Jesus, look what happened. We preached and people repented. We cast out demons. We healed the sick. And every one of them is wanting Jesus. They're wanting Jesus' time so that they can tell him all the great things that happened. And in the midst of this, the disciples of John suddenly tell Jesus, oh, by the way, Jesus, Herod wants to see you. With the implication, perhaps, that Herod wants more than just to see him, but perhaps wants his head on a plate as well. And then look what follows. He goes from this funeral dirge to a triumphant march to this kind of worry, really? And then a vast crowd comes with the disciples 
looking for Jesus, this crowd of humanity. What had been a calm start to the day is now busy with activity. It's so busy that there was no chance to eat. The morning had been full of the unexpected. First, the death of a friend, a life threatened, a celebration with the returning disciples, and then he's nearly suffocated by the pressing crowds. Put simply, bereavement, jeopardy, jubilation, bedlam. And it's not over yet. Jesus decides to take the disciples away to a quiet place, so they set off across the lake. Now, I don't think I would ever question Jesus' desire here to get away from the people for a while, for a few hours alone, for a respite, a retreat, a time to pray, a time with no demands, and an evening round the campfire with his friends. The crowd has other ideas, don't they? They set off running round the lake, and they meet the boat on the other side. So when the boat reaches land, surprise, surprise, 5,000 men plus women and children are waiting for Jesus. So add to the list of sorrow, peril, excitement, and bedlam, interruption. We're up to five now. Jesus' plans are interrupted. What Jesus wants and what he gets are not the same thing. Does that sound familiar as well? Because Jesus wasn't exempt from human problems. He does know how we feel. Now, we might have trouble believing that. We accept, oh yes, Jesus was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but somehow we find it hard to believe that God can relate to the headaches and heartaches of daily life. Perhaps that's why all four Gospels chronicle this day. Listen to these words from the book to the, the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 4. I'm going to read this from J.B. Phillips' translation. For we have no superhuman high priest to whom our weaknesses are unintelligible. He himself shared fully in our experience of temptation, except he never sinned. The writer of Hebrews seems to know that we're going to say, God, it's all right for you up there. You don't know how hard it is down here. But look at those words again. He himself shared fully in all our experiences. Note the word all our experiences. Why? So he can relate to our weaknesses. You know, when Jesus lands on the shore, he steps into a sea of humanity. Remember, he crossed the sea to get away from people. But his love for people overcomes the need for rest. It says he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick, and he taught them many things. It's doubtful if anyone in the crowd thinks to say to Jesus, oh, by the way, Jesus, how are you feeling today? Is it getting too much for you? doesn't happen. Nobody has come to give. Everyone has come to take. Many of those he healed would never say thank you, but he healed them anyway. Most would be concerned with being healthy rather than holy. And some who asked for bread today will be asking for crucifixion tomorrow. But he healed them anyway. And it's interesting in this passage that there is no sign of stress seen in Jesus. None at all. But it is in the disciples. As evening comes along, they go to Jesus with a demand. It's not a question, it's a request. It's a demand. Send the crowds away. After all, you've taught them, you've healed them, you've given in to their wishes. Now it's late and they're getting hungry. Do they expect you to feed them as well? You know, this is one of those occasions in Scripture when I wish we had video, because I would love to have seen the expression on the disciples' face when Jesus answered them. He says, there's no need to send them away. You feed them. You can imagine the disciples, what? What? You feed, we, me, feed them. Now, if you look up commentaries on this passage, you find that all these learned fellows have all sorts of ideas about what this is about, but you can group them into two main groups. One lot says it was a rhetorical request because Jesus knew the disciples wouldn't do it 
and couldn't do it. Well, I'm not so sure about the couldn't. Others say it was a test so that they would rely on God for the things that they couldn't do. Now, I'll go along with the fact that he was, he was testing them to a point. But it wasn't either of those things. It was to show them that they could, what they could do. When he says, you feed them, it was a definite request for them to do something, to demonstrate their abilities. After all, they'd just come back from a tour where they'd been achieving the impossible. They'd been healing the sick, they'd been casting out demons. And he said to them, do it again. Do it again. Give them something to eat. Now, I would love to be able to say that they did. I would love to be able to say that they knew that if God asked them to do something, he'll empower them to do it. But I can't say that. Rather than look to God, they get the wallets out and they start counting their money. You can imagine that in today's parlance, they'd be coming along and saying, fish suppers for all this lot. That would cost a week's wages, a year's wages. Don't miss the contrasting views here. When Jesus saw the people, he saw an opportunity to help them, an opportunity to show love and care and affirm their value. The disciples saw 5,000 problems. Here's where Jesus should have given up. This is the point in a pressure-packed day when he should have shouted up to God, beam me up, Scotty, I've had enough. But he didn't. Instead, a child's play piece becomes a feast and everybody's fed. Now, let's look at this day one more time in a whole series of bullet points. It starts with intense sorrow. It has immediate threat. It has immeasurable joy. It has immense crowds. It has insensitive interruptions. And it has incredible demands. And now, right at the end, it has inept assistance. But Jesus was calm throughout all this. And the reason he was calm, I'm sure, is that he knew the incredible value of people. I want to finish with another story here. There's a boy who went into a pet shop looking for a pet puppy. And he was shown a litter in a cage and the boy picked each one up, carefully looked at it and examined it and put it back in the cage. He turned to the guy in the shop and he said, how much for one of these? And the fella told him the price. And he said, I'll be back when I've raised the money. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the shopman, I said to him, well, don't take too long because these puppies sell quickly. And the boy smiled as he was about to go out the shop and he said to the guy, oh, I'm not worried. My puppy will still be there. So the boy went to work and he started weeding people's gardens, washing windows, washing cars, cutting grass. And he worked hard and he saved every penny that he earned. And when he had enough money, he went back to the pet shop, took a pocket full of change out of his pocket and put it on the counter. And he said to the guy, I've come for me, my puppy. So the shopkeeper counted the money and when he knew that it was the right money, he said, go and choose your puppy. So the lad went off to the, to the cage and he reached right to the back of the cage and he picked out a puppy. And it was skinny and thin and poor looking, and it had a limp leg. And the shopkeeper said to him, don't take that one. It'll, you'll never be able to take it for a long walk. It won't be able to run with you. The dog's crippled. You'll never fetch. You won't be able to play with him. Take one of the healthy ones. And the boy said, no, this is the puppy I want. And he told the man it was exactly the kind of dog he'd been looking for. And as the boy turned to go out of the store, the shopkeeper started to speak to him and then he shut up and he remained silent because he suddenly understood. Because extending from the bottom of the boy's trousers was a brace for his weak leg. What did the, why did the boy want that particular dog? Because he knew how it felt to be like that. And he knew that it was special. What did Jesus know that enabled him to do the things that he did on his pressurized day? He knew how people felt. He knew 
that people were special. And he still does. So next time we face stressful and stormy days, remember this. You're special in the eyes of God. Amen. And thanks be to God for this preaching of his word. And over several pages. Let's turn to God in prayer again. Let us pray. Loving God, we pray for all those who are weighed down by the stresses and strains of daily living. Those who long for peace of mind but can't find it. We pray for those who are oppressed by worry, unable to throw off their anxieties, held captive by a multitude of fears. And we pray for those who lose themselves in busyness, masking their true feelings, running from their emptiness, and hoping that staying busy and active will bring them happiness and peace. And we pray for those, Lord, who have no time for you, no interest in anything outside their daily routine, no awareness of spiritual needs. Living God, Speak to each one in your still small voice and grant your peace and a quiet confidence which only you can bring so that burdens can be lifted and spirits refreshed. Almighty God, ruler of the ends of the earth, we pray for our King Charles III as he sets out on his road of service. Strengthen his faith in you, Lord, and renew his sense of duty to our nation and commonwealth, and grant that he may serve and follow you for the rest of his days. Father God, we also remember today before you all those people and places in the world where there is a great longing for peace. We remember the people of Sudan hiding from two warring factions, too frightened to leave their homes we remember the people of Ukraine struggling to protect their homes and their own country from a much more powerful aggressor. We remember the people of Palestine who can only watch as their homes and lands are taken from them, sadly, Lord, in the name of religion. We remember the plight of women in Iran and Afghanistan and the plight of people in many other places, Lord, like Iraq, Myanmar, Taiwan, Yemen, wherever the gun threatens and the bomb kills and maims. Lord God, speak to the nations. Instigate a movement for peace in the world. Lord God, in your mercy, look upon your world that we have made a mess of and restore it to the beauty of its creation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the next praise is my lighthouse, and Angela is going to come leaping up here, full of vim and vigour, and show us the actions for it. <laughs> Phone. Is it on? Is it on? Okay, hi. <laughs> oh, we've got names for all the microphones, by the way. You're wearing the Britney Spears microphone today. This is, this is the same as Britney Spears. This is the Cher microphone. <laughs> but I'm not going to sing Cher. Okay, so boys and girls, boys and girls, do you want to come and do a dance today? Do you feel the need to shake off those bones and come and do a wee dance with me? Would you like to? Would you like to learn some actions? Yeah? This song's called My Lighthouse. Have you seen a lighthouse before? Have you seen one? Do you know what a lighthouse is? Have you seen one, Ali? Yeah. What's a lighthouse? It shines up in the dark. I couldn't say it any better myself, Ali. It shines in the dark, doesn't it? And it helps to guide the ships as they pass by the land so they don't crash don't they yeah i wonder why do you think god is our lighthouse why do you think god would be our lighthouse what would he help us do 
I don't know. Okay, well, because sometimes our lives can be pretty stormy, can't they? Because one day you can be just walking and, oh, I've tripped and fallen over. And I've hurt my knee. And it's really sore. And you feel really sad. But there, shining in the darkness, is your lighthouse, is God. And he will help you feel better and feel stronger, won't he? And sometimes for adults, the waves can be pretty high. And they can keep coming. And we'll be like, oh. But there, shining in the darkness, is lighthouse. So we learn some actions. Because I know I'm talking too long. And Ian's going to be going, Angela, you're talking too long. <laughs> Right, okay, I'll put the microphone down. Honestly, give me a microphone. <laughs> right, so, we'll just do the chorus actions, okay? So, we go, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust. 
Why don't you get the breath back? <laughs> I couldn't do that. My legs wouldn't let us. <laughs> Just before we go, I'll tell you another story. This is true, and it's actually recorded in the annals of the United States Navy. There was two battleships out on exercise, and the lead battleship with the Commodore was heading back towards port, and the lookout out on the wings of the bridge shouted, Light on the starboard bow! And the captain looked at him and said, Is it moving or is it standing still? No, it stands still. So he got them to flash a message. Tells you how old a thing this is. He didn't use the radio in those days. Flash the message with the Aztec, I think they used to call it. Flash this message and said, I'm a battleship. Move 20 degrees and we're coming through. And he got a message back saying, no, you move 20 degrees. You, you know, it's your turn to move, not mine. So the captain thought for a bit and he said, send him another message, say, I'm a battleship and I'm coming through. So he thought, that he got a response back, no. So he sent another message, I'm the Commodore, we're coming through. And he got a message back saying, I'm a leading seaman second class. You've got to move. I'm not moving. So he sent another message just saying move, and the guy said, sorry, I can't. I'm the lighthouse. <laughs> <laughs> when the light of God's shining, we need to follow where it's telling us to go. Because like that song said, the lighthouse in the stormy sea will guide us. The light of God's always there. And as I've just said, you know, God will light that light because we are special to him and because he loves us. And he doesn't want us to go through all the troubles and things that not obeying would lead us to. So remember the lighthouse. I like that song. I couldn't do the actions. Well, I could, but I'd rather not because I might have fallen down at the end of it. <laughs> when you've got asthma, you don't actually leap about the place like that too often, you know. But anyway, remember that. The lighthouse is there to guide us away from trouble. And when trouble comes, God's always there because we're special and he loves us. Let's say a short prayer. Father God, we know that you're the lighthouse to us, that you want to guide us and keep us safe in troubled seas. When trouble strikes, Lord, help us to follow the, the instructions of your light and not to go wandering off on our own and making our troubles worse. Help us to realize that your love is greater than anything we can ever understand, that you think we are so special and that you really want to help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We finish with, oh, a hymn that I know, good heavens, what a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs>
now into the world and do the work which Christ has called you to do. When Jesus said, you feed them, he meant it. So go and feed the people of the world with the good news of Jesus. And may others, as they meet you, meet Jesus and know his living presence for themselves, the presence which eases the stress and the pressures of life. And the blessing of Almighty God, the loving Father, the saving Son, and the comforting Holy Spirit be with you all today and stay with you always. Amen.